I want to get, uh, this is uh, framing, I'll talk about what framing is and what it isn't. Basically, what you can say is that you have certain principles, those are principles. You can say that you have certain criteria for membership and a certain idea, That's those are criteria for membership. What framing is, is saying these are the things that we believe in, right? So you need principles first. You say, these are the things that we believe in, and then you start to incul inculcate those things that you believe in into the, into the general swarm of ideas in society. So uh, it, is not it is not an argument. It is not one argument. It is not advertising. It isn't you know, buying a media book. The idea is you want to get people aligned with your way of thinking at a deep level. So, for example, this is a, a good uh, strategy. No, you don't think so. Oh, sorry. Um, I think it's great. The uh, a good example is when you call something, uh, you know, the, the sort of um, uh, rights of the unborn or uh, freedom to choose or something like that. You're actually connecting to other ideas that are floating in society. The first time you hear something like that, it sounds very strange, right? When we first started hearing about things like that in the 80s, it seemed very strange. Then it becomes very common because it's connecting to other things in our lives. So if we talk about uh, traditional architecture, as traditional architecture, then everybody who isn't thinking traditional architecture, that immediately turns them off. What are you doing? You can just you can talk about that if you want to as an example, right? What I did with you? Yeah. That's an example of framing. Yeah, that, that's a what I did with Michael was an exercise in figuring out the principles that you uh, that you want to espouse. And there's there's sort of a, the uh, the rights that you want to, you want to, you want to look at the rights, you want to look at the responsibilities, you want to look at some other stuff, but basically the rights and the responsibilities are the clear thing. Then you can come up with what your principles should be, and from that you've got the framing where you connect to society in general. And the idea is to hook into ideas that everybody already has, and that you're not co-opting them, but you're connecting to them. The, and it's very, and it's literally neurological. You want to make sure that when this fires, when your, your thought about one thing fires, your thought about the other thing fires. When you, thought, when you think about um, uh, downtown urban living or something, you want people to think about traditional architecture. Maybe. So how do you connect downtown vibrant urban living, you know, millennials and, you know, all that sort of thing to traditional architecture? Then you have to figure out what triggers will go at the same time so that literally the neurons fire at the same time. You think I'm kidding. It's actually mirror neurons, there's a thing. Could I ask something? Um, we, we, the charter will be what we're thinking. What I think we should emphasize is a discussion of what other people are thinking that we can connect to. I think a discussion of what are people thinking that we can connect to. Right, part of what we can do than the framing. Part of what we can do is to deconstruct what it is that's working for these other groups and what they're connected to. So for example, uh, I was looking at a website that had nothing to do with traditional architecture, had nothing to do with architecture at all. It was strictly on a web a sort of web design. And there was a guy introducing it, and he was in an apartment, you know, clearly an urban downtown apartment, floor-to-ceiling glass, very modern talking about this other thing, right? So he's a bearded, millennial, um, young, you know, you got this sort of vibrant feel in a modernist building. So that pairing is really happening, right? Uh, it's, it's, that's the way that they're succeeding. It's just, you can simply pair them. You can just present them together so that people mentally associate one with the other, right? It has nothing to do with the, the logic. lumberjack shirt and the law <laughs> are actually the definition of what's cool now in the world. Right. So the beer and, 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 and urban. The same. And, and I think that there may be sort of a, a connection there between 
the sort of um, the the lumberjack. What they call them? The uh, lumber sexual. <laughs> lumber sexual. <laughs> the lumber sexual. The, the the sort of bearded thing. The sort of um, yeah. steampunk tradition. You know, all this sort of handmade stuff. I think that there is a connection in through handmade stuff, millennials, urban vibrancy, but also like we're trying to make our way in the world and everything is getting automated so there's a reaction against automation. I think that there's a cluster of ideas that we can actually start to draw together and it doesn't have to be logically connected. It just has to be. They're very different demographics. We have to know what we're going for. For uh, you know the millennials or the or the baby boomers because they're very different from each other. Yes. They are. Okay. And another thing about this is <laughs> so that's a decision that has to be made. <laughs> okay, David Robert, the first thing I want to say that the, there are two rules: is one that people economically look to the people who are immediately above them in the economic scale. So sort of lower middle class looks to middle class, middle class looks to upper middle class, upper middle class looks to the rich, and then the rich look to the wealthy. There's a difference. Um, uh, in terms of ages, everybody looks to the age cohort that's just below them. So if you're in your like 60s-ish, you're kind of looking at the people that are in their 40s. If you're in your 40s, you're looking at people that are like early 30s, 20s, that sort of thing. Um, and then it does stop because nobody looks at children. But basically, you're, you're looking to the previous generation and you're looking to the higher income. A as exemplars for what you want to do. I'm sorry? I don't think that's a millennial. Millennial? What do you think? I, I, just, I think one, your gap between middle and high is getting so big it's just, you can't go really low there. And I think oh, you mean economically? Yeah, I think there's another looking at the ground level where you're, there's a desire to get down. Right, I'm saying that everybody looks at the group that's one. So if, if you're a millennial and you're just really scraping by, you're looking towards comfortable people. No. Well, for example, no, that's a big example. difference. I would say the tiny house movement, which is really powerful right now, could be connected with traditional architecture. Yeah, could. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to, I, I board everybody on the list uh, with the food and architecture comparison, but I'll do it for anybody in the room that hasn't <laughs> already heard it. But um, the farm to table movement, I mean, it is universal. And if you look at that, it's for, uh, organic, natural, local, handmade. Um, all the things that are sort of the basis of, of uh, classicism. I think all of the slow and handmade movements are a lot. When I talk to people of really any age and I make this you know, comparison to slow food or um, a farm to table or anything as, as being linked to traditional architecture, usually a light bulb goes off and it, even, even a dyed in wool modernist right, will right, understand right. that. I think that we can align all of those as sort of one gestalt slow idea. Slow food, slow architecture, slow urbanism, slow financing, slow everything. Slow handmade craft, sort of Brooklyn idea of everything is handmade, and you know there's even a, a typeface that type. There's a whole thing. Right. Uh, I'm gonna. I want to get off the stage, but uh, there's one in the back. I was just gonna go back to the idea of who our audience is, and the other day on the list I said something about you know it's. There's a renaissance going on, and there's a revolution going on. And we find here in Charleston that anybody that we're talking to engages on one of those things. They're, I mean, it might be particular to this place, but they're either interested in the traditional architecture for its beauty, or they're interested for the reasons, or you can kind of bring them to seeing what you're talking about through reasons of sustainability and Slow, right. things like that. Well, a big part of it is first in framing. It's a big part of what you see yourself, what we, what you would like your best self to be, what image you want to have, what you want to do, what you want to project, what you want to sort of mirror, literally mirror, right? Um, in, in the the sense that you know, one person in a group crosses their legs, and a lot of people will cross their legs. So people unconsciously do that. So um, unless there's sociopaths, which is a whole other thing, but you know, we're. we're I would say the, the only limit on our audience should be we don't want psychopaths or sociopaths. <laughs> Everybody else should be in. Um, but that's the audience for the framing. Now the marketing goes out from there. So the marketing is to a particular group. Can I say marketing is the key to the whole thing because what you have is the selling of a dream. Ben and Jerry, two men had an idea. I'm, so I'm stepping down. I feel like okay. I talked to um, so, so we have to go back to Ben's podcast. Uh,
if we actually made a circle in front of each yeah. other, yeah. Yes, then okay. there wouldn't be the embarrassed person or the person okay. in the back who I can't see. And actually, it would be much more dynamic. You could actually, you could actually move to the drawing and drafting room. Let's do it. It's already kind of set up Let's that way. It. Let's do that. So uh, we, we'll see. We may have too much pressure on the chair. Forming a circle in order to listen to me. <laughs> What I have to say is very brief and very simple, uh, and that is that uh, uh, what we are doing is framing a discussion that eventually is going to make it out into the world. Yeah, yeah. Most of the societies that's talking about influencing uh, happen to be democracies. Uh, but democracy can happen at a high level and it can happen at a low level. And, uh, with the uh, idea of embracing what we can conceivably embrace, embrace and conceivably do. Uh, it seems to me that there is a, a model for, you know, above and beyond, or below and beyond, whatever, however you want to say it, uh, uh, education is vital and reforming education is vital, but uh, ultimately uh, the question of architecture in the built environment has to become a major public issue in the same way that the, the natural environment has become. And I believe that uh, that, that uh, can be done uh, as, a, as a journalist. I uh, have no problem saying that this can be done through the news, uh, that it can be done through advocacy, and that advocacy uh, can be uh, focused on events that have caught the public attention. Uh, in uh, Britain, Several years ago, there was a great debate over Chelsea Barracks, and the result of that debate uh, placed designs by Richard Rogers uh, against designs by Quinlan Terry for a development in the center of London. And uh, these uh, illustrations got paired uh, in the electronic media or the digital media, I guess I should say these days. Uh, and, uh, Votes were taken, polls were taken, tallies were taken, and in all of these polls, it turned out that, uh, for some strange reason that most of us understand perfectly well, uh, Quinlan Terry's design for uh, Chelsea Barracks uh, uh, had two and three and four times the number of adherents uh, than the uh, Richard Rogers thing, and uh, I think uh, that uh, that. Uh, that focused attention on architecture in Britain in a major way. Of course, what the United States lacks is a Prince Charles. And, uh, but we can make up, up for that because we have, uh, I, I apologize, Congress, wherever you are. David, uh, didn't that involve conflict for it to become news? Yes. Yes. Okay, so, so one of the things you're positing here is that it was, it was actually framed as conflict. It wasn't just this is happening. It wasn't just news. It wouldn't have gone very far unless there was an ongoing conflict that was actually artificially induced and prolonged by people who, in whose interest it was. But don't you also need to frame the, frame the enemy, frame the opponent? And um, I mean, it's good that we frame that there's internal debate, but the bigger issue is how does this group define the opposition, right? right. But uh, let me just explain what uh, I would conceive as a necessary aspect of uh, causing framing to have an impact. And that is that uh, at the level that uh, Catherine was discussing a little while ago, uh, the level of the uh, city council, the level of the design review board, uh, that level where particular <coughs> projects get approved or disapproved. Uh, it seems to me that uh, we're talking about uh, people who, in a democracy, can be influenced. And uh, so, you know, we uh, don't all necessarily have access to digital media. Uh, we aren't a network. Uh, we aren't uh, a newspaper. Uh, but we do have the, uh, uh, the ability to go and create conflict at these meetings. And uh, conflict is what we're talking about. And uh, it seems to me that if it is indeed true, as I believe it is, that most people prefer traditional architecture because they are natural biological people, they plug into those aspects of classical architecture and traditional architecture. <laughs> okay.
secret. We get where we have to go. So anyway, uh, <laughs> it seems to me that the ICA, which has uh, 15 <laughs> chapters and is growing, uh, is uh, one arm through which activism can be brought to bear on these fulcrum points in our political society. Uh, the politics of traditional versus modern architecture is not a uh, thing that needs to transcend nonpartisanship. It is a nonpartisan issue. It is sometimes made into a partisan issue by people trying to agitate. It's uh, framed but, into a partisan issue. Right. Yeah. right. But, but we need to counter <coughs> that for a little bit. But, but the is, I, I think that to get to the root of it, I think the partisanship is actually more part of the market. And what I mean by that is this. Let's ask what sorts of things modernism deprives you of, and what sorts of things do traditionalism or traditional design, uh, what sorts of things do tradition, does, does traditional design uh, give you? So, um, uh, for example, you, you might have a right to an environment that is, that is mentally supported, right? So you can say, and part of this is connecting to expertise, right? And this is a, actually part of framework. So you say, um, what? You know, just say no. that right is a loaded word, OK? <laughs> a right to something as opposed to a responsibility. The right wing immediately goes ballistic when you say people have rights. But if you speak of responsibilities, they are calm. Mm -hmm. So every word is loaded now, and you have to be very careful about that. Well, every time you talk about, as Michael knows, because I worked through with him, through this with him, every time you come up with something, you should have a right and a responsibility, and then you, you choose to win them. You choose, they're always win, and that's what I said, what I did with Michael. And it was an exercise that he found successful. Yeah. The, the, the architects have a professional uh, responsibility uh, to provide for the needs of the ordinary citizens, and the ordinary citizens have a right to that. Right. What I was, what I was saying is, and let me, let me, you were interrupted me once. Uh, I know, and by the way, I right. should, I think that this is only going to have any energy if we actually feel free to interrupt with each other the way they do on television. <laughs> that people would just speak until they're good and finished, and then you have a five minute pause to make sure it actually kills the audience. Yeah. So if you have an enthusiastic response, you just interrupt, and this is something we've learned from modern media. Fine, I finished what I was saying. <laughs> okay. the, 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 what we need to do is we need to say that. Um, we need to connect to the actual advantages and disadvantages, identify them, come up with rights and responsibilities for each one, and also connect to where expertise exists. And there is expertise saying, mentally, it's better for you to be in traditional architecture <laughs> and, and that sort of thing. There is stuff that actually supports that. There are studies. Okay. There are studies, and actually, Michael. Let me give an example that will clarify absolutely. When I was in Cuba in the master plan for Vedado, they said something I've never heard before, which is the citizens said, we have a right to a nightlife. Okay? And then they said, and we have a responsibility to behave right. in a civilized way. And that was absolutely evened it out. So we actually see the dialectic. Exactly. We have a right to a traditional architecture. We have a right to maintain it properly. You know, the, the developers have the right to do this, and they have the responsibility to do that. That is a framing that will actually, will actually uh, is perfectly balanced to, to, for the right and the left. So Michael, briefly, can you walk people through what I did with you? Well, I had it up on the screen, but it's, I've taken it off already. Uh, I mean, we should maybe talk about it later. And I you can certainly, it, I suppose, if we want to do that. It was, I don't know if you all remember, there were four points that I thought maybe we could, all of us, agree that these are the sort of core differences we have with the, the orthodoxy in architecture, which is the, the modernist orthodoxy that's existed since about 1920 or so. And, uh, and so Bruce took me through those and said, okay, take those and break them down into the, the, af the affirmative side and then the negative side, what, um, what are the, the, the positive uh, frames of each of those and then what are the things that you mustn't do as an architect or you mustn't have in society if you're going to 
Uh, and do you guys want to? Okay, just one thing I'd like to say. I think if we attack the orthodoxy of modernism alone, it's not news and it's old and it's boring. I agree. I think we have to at at attack, believe it or not, orthodoxies. Right. And we have to say, there's an orthodoxy of classicism, there's an orthodoxy of modernism, wh wh both of which are not agile enough to deal but, with the 21st century, and there's a vast field in the middle which is undefended. But I think if you and that's those, actually a new proposition, because yeah. we also have the responsibility to be new. I this, think, this I think is you put those two together, though, you're going to model the frame of what the sort of core issue is. In, you talked about the 280s of the 300 schools or whatever. Those guys are not worried about the orthodoxy of classicism. They're worried about hanging on to the orthodoxy of, of, of uh, you know, of CM. I know, but we're not talking to the to the professors. We're talking to the students. Right, but they're and talking and, to everybody else too. But the students also don't particularly like any kind of orthodoxy. Right. Well, so yeah, that's, that's the framing. A, that, we're speaking to the students of the next generation. What they don't like is orthodoxy. Is only one generation. The students of the next generation haven't necessarily heard the arguments that. Some people in the room might think are old arguments, so they're still. If you crack the shell of the modern orthodoxy, then they're open. To exactly. Their... When you tell the students they're that they're not being taught something, very quickly they're like, "Hang on, it's what is this that I'm missing?" Yeah, yeah, it's news to young people. It's not news to us. Yeah. <coughs> well, one thing that I've been curious about, in, since you start talking about schism, is it seems to be talking about schism amongst us, and as opposed to. Classicism, modernism. And I've sort of been struggling with that. And one way it sort of starts to make sense to me is if the discussion is between us about what a viable architecture is, and the presumption underlying it on both sides is modernism has failed utterly. We don't have to talk about it, right? Mm -hmm. It is irrelevant. Yes, exactly. It has no place at the table. Mm -hmm. And then the discussion is here, this is the architectural discussion. Yes. This is the debate. It's kind of setting up modernism and as the void. Yeah. yeah. It's the lack they're, of something. They're old hat. They're, they're done. Yeah. And yes, we need to target the young people, the students. We also need to target the client class and let them let it be okay for them to recognize that the emperor has no clothes. Yeah. So we have to do that with the younger generation though, because that group is looking down for it to the uh, But early. we also need to address the older generation yeah. of a lot of the people who But if they're looking to the younger generation the developers the don't have a personality. Their personality is the customer. Yeah. And yeah. the customer is younger. Yeah. And, and the people who commission they don't modernist have buildings for the institution that they give money to, mm -hmm. or for the business they run, go home to nice traditional houses. They hire us. They're our clients. <laughs> and we need to make it okay for them to say in the public forum yeah. that this is what I like, this is what I like. Yeah. And my for you as well. Going to pay for and, and for the client class, part of it is you're being cheated. Mm -hmm. you're, you're getting, not just between traditional and non-traditional, but between somebody who throws up a column in the middle of nowhere mm -hmm. and has a wandering cornice that goes all over the place. I'm staying in a place that we've, I've come <coughs> the house of a wandering cornice. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> it, it, is, it is nonsensical. They're, whoever bought that is being cheated. Yeah. So, literally, you know, somebody said I can do that, and they can't, couldn't do it, right? So, um, part of the framing is about getting your money's worth, getting the real thing, getting it unadulterated, um, that sort of thing. And that's a different question from traditional or not traditional. But Bruce, I think you're missing one of the important frames here. The reason that Justin is now writing for Forbes magazine and and uh, David's blog is is getting uh, read for wide and so on is that there, there is a, uh, a process going on right now where the projects that we all knew about five or 10 years ago, we saw them on the boards, they're getting built. And the public is having a visceral reaction to these projects. And they're saying, when they see things written, yeah, what the heck is up with this stuff? And I think that's a moment that, you know, framing is always about sort of 
capturing the, the, the what's already out there in terms of the way people are thinking, yeah. right? But I think the, the, the Forbes yeah. issue, the Forbes is actually, it's fantastic that we're reaching an audience, but the Forbes is also a liability for us for frame. Well, that's another issue, but that's, and this I think room, we need many frames. This room is also a liability for us for frame. Well, true. Because but, it's white guy, white girl, white guy, white girl, white but, guy, white but girl. But the, the, the antidote to that is more true. It's white not to stop doing anything. Doing There's a different, oh, today somebody, frame it, today somebody said, the new urbanism is considered a left-wing movement, right? Somebody right. said that. The entire discussion of new urbanism now is how we got framed as a right-wing movement. Yeah. Yeah. How did we get back into being a right-wing movement? <coughs> the new urbanism has an incredible agility politically. And I can actually just present exactly the same principles depending on this audience or that audience. And we all know how to do it. Okay? And I think one of the things we might consider here is that there actually may need to be, given this society, two kinds of framing. But, but, but rather Same than being sort of, but, but two frames. But I guess rather than be a chameleon and sort of go back and forth, why not be something that's actually above those other two, a cross-cutting uh, movement that is clearly, you know, embracing both. I mean, I know that's a harder frame to achieve, but it's... If we, it's don't, the, if we, don't, uh, if we ignore academia, if we ignore academia, we can do that. The minute academia gets in, they're too hypersensitive to that. And then they start saying, well, not only are they not going to black people, where are the, where are the uh, uh, what they call the obviously gay people, and where are, you know, and then you, well, uh, yeah, no, I mean, we, and we have an expert well, on this. Well, we don't <laughs> this is getting into some of the areas of the stuff that I don't want to be in, or even, you know, I don't care what you're saying, so, <laughs> which has to do with, you know, if we want to take our victories where we can, it is much easier to make a case to conservatives. Let's be honest. I can go to political politicians yes. and talk about Western civilization and listen to what Tom Maine has to say. I mean, I just found a quote which I'm going to use of Tom Maine saying that he has no sympathy for the victims of 9-11, that he could just as easily make the case for the other side, that he's out of sync with America. Yeah. That just works more for Republicans than Democrats, that kind of stuff. Even though you would think, well, that's true. who doesn't support America? But, to, yeah, but, but that's that, kind of culture war sort of talk. To this, 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 this is actually kind of an anecdote yeah. that I don't think is relevant to our framing. But one thing that most people don't know is that Muhammad Atta to, uh, had a personal grudge against modern architecture. He was a planner. Yeah. Yeah. He wrote a master's thesis about how modernism ruined the city well, of Aleppo. But, but let's be clear what he was saying. He was saying he didn't like the fact that, that, that Western culture destroyed the city of Aleppo. And the Corbusier was very much a part of that. So uh, I think what you can say is that there is a there is a dynamic there that is uh, that the the terrorists are feeding into. It doesn't mean the dynamic is terrorism. It means the dynamic is people who are resentful of what is happening in their own world. Right. So well, I don't think that's not that. All I'm saying, all I'm saying, all I'm saying is you can spin this. <laughs> you can spin it in your direction. Well, but, no, you but you do. but you're going to get lost. What you need to do is sort of get to the overarching theme and be very clear about that. And I think that's what the framing is all about. The, the, the overarching thing. frame can be what we talked about in the top, but it's never the way to get everyone else right. to come right. into you're, you're, it. The, you're the selling green, spinning around. The, the understanding that you need to have the different uh, marketing approach, if you will, for each audience that you're going to. And the audience to somebody in Charleston um, is very fine tuned differently than what the audience would be if we're going to somebody in New Haven. And those are all on the same side there, when we get to other and, sides. There's two things, things we find that appeal to everybody we talk to environmentalism and localism. Yeah. Yes. And environment is big. And, and after our talk yesterday, a high school student came up to me and said, Oh, can you come and talk to our AP environmental studies class? And I never once mentioned style, I didn't mention environment. Yeah. Okay, but okay, now a subset of environmentalism, that sets some people off, as you know, quite a lot of people. There is a word that actually spreads. There's a difference between mitigation and adaptation. Mitigation is worldwide, adaptation is local. Okay, because you can actually do, you can adapt to the circumstances that happens to be beneficial. Insofar as you present adaptation, you bridge left and right. If you speak of mitigation, the United Nations handles that, and Obama, and the big guys, and you lose the right immediately. So I would say, yes, have a green, but a nuanced green that has to say with local adaptation to environmental problems. I, I'd also be skeptical of this idea that everyone accepts localism. Yeah, sure, if you're talking about young people, but not when you're talking about global corporations, right? And we're living in an era of global capitalism. 
these companies want to build the same thing all around the world. They don't want to be too identified with any one nation because that's not how their business operates. But they are the same as developers. They don't really have that own personality. They only exist if they can sell their product. Instead of engaging the consumer. So it's what the consumer wants, which eventually, if we could change that word sure. to citizen, we could make a whole different step, but that's a, that's a larger step. Right, and more Frank Gehry. This was her metaphor for foreign policy. And so in other words, she has no problem with the fact that Gary builds the same thing all around the world. She <laughs> wrote that she No, 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 but it's also gross that it's on but it's like an abandoned the Greek. I mean, no, but the, notice how clever that is. Gary right. does the same thing and presents himself as completely original every time. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the architects are able to bamboozle the client and say, oh yeah, it's contemporary. Okay. Yeah. Can we yeah. talk about the greatest success story of the last ten years? Dwell magazine. Right. Dwell magazine did not exist ten years ago at all. And Architecture Digest was this thick, and Dwell Magazine was non-existent. Have you seen this relative sizes now? Yeah. They're the opposite. Okay, there is something, and, and their specific agenda was to actually change the preferred style of the common folk. That was their agenda. You know, and we know the lady who actually did it. And one of the things that first shocked me when I saw it was a young woman, this happened about five years ago, who said, if I see one more oak cabinet, I'll puke into the kitchen sink. <laughs> okay? And there's an article in the New York Times that says, a dark furniture is so unpopular that the, that the uh, this is last week, that the antique stores won't even take it. They actually take it directly to the dump. They won't even hold it for resale because nobody wants to buy it. And there's Ikea, Ikea, Ikea. And I think we have to figure out how they did that. What is it that they did that apart from a generational transformation, what is it about what we want to do that somehow was overcome by this 10-year conscious agenda? People in the pictures. Mm -hmm. They Don't put people, people I, I, I actually know about that. Yeah. The thing that Dwell did yeah. is they put people in the pictures so that you could see yourself being a modern, up-to-date person, but with, with stories, right? So you have all kinds of, you, know, you notice in Dwell, there's a lot of very clean lines. But there's also some like plywood painted sign from like 1912 in the corner, and mm -hmm. and so you put your you imagine yourself in the picture, living this exemplary life, being of simplicity, of simplicity, mm -hmm. and, 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 and you have dog, a dog, and there's, and there's a dog, and, and there's people cooking. Barefoot. That is that is exactly framing. The dog house is an iPhone that has all your photos and all your music and all the videos you've ever wanted. It is the blank canvas upon which you can paint your and cosmopolitan modern lifestyle. And, and what does that will do to get you, they show, they show people documenting their lives, uh, documenting the wonderful things that they're doing, that whole sort of um, think different, different campaign of, of, you know, doing exciting things with the Apple, you know, monocular cyclopic I don't know what that is, <laughs> but uh, they took that whole aesthetic and they grafted it onto you know vibrant life, and that managed to get them going. But they, they, they also well perceived a pendulum shift that was already occurring and just got on it. I don't think that they marketed anything specific. I I sold plain brown furniture for twenty years, and in 1997 I said I'm not going to do this anymore. This is ridiculous, and so I got out of it. And it just seemed like it kept going, and that was the end of it. And you can't even give it away, like you said. It's in the streets. This exact thing absolutely happened in the '60s. Exactly. It goes I, back and forth. Exist. Um, I, Where's our pendulum? That's what we need to see. Where's the pendulum, and how do we get to it? And then it'll just happen. I'm going to just get to the pendulum, and then it'll just swing by the way. As everyone was getting rid of their. <laughs> In the 60s, in traditional <laughs> houses, we're getting them from the thrift stores and putting them in there. 17th and 18th century houses. Yep. And these people are now 75 and, and 85 years old. And there were thousands and thousands of dollars. And nobody cares. But there's a difference this time. It's different. I, I was in the 60s. I remember. I grew up in a mid century modern house with Danish furniture. It was very hip. And it wasn't. You know, that, that was one thing. Now, I think that the young people are subscribing to Dwell Magazine 
they, you know, Dwell Magazine has put a face on sustainability. They took a bland architectural type that had, was immature and was coming out of the USGBC and LEED certification, and they called it something. They made it home. You know, they put, um, they made it to something that was familiar that people aspired to, even though it was sort of blah. And then it, it sort of morphed into a, a neo-modern revival, but it was really the face of sustainability. One thing, one thing. I, I think we, we have to question our assumptions. For example, I, I went to Banana Republic a few years ago, and I said, I really love your khakis. They have a good fit. You have a lot of choice. They come in half sizes. But what I can't stand is that they wear out within two years. Here, right? And I hate shopping. And the, and the young woman said, why would you want them to last longer than two years? <laughs> so I think the very assumption that we say we want permanence and so forth, I think even that, I think, may not be how we lead. Yeah. Okay, because you want new, you want, you know, it's the next iPhone and so forth. So I think, I think the idea of this being different from the principles that may have been actually perfectly recognizable 20 years ago in the high point of the classical revival is that we have to be aware that we can't deploy, we may not be able to deploy exactly the same arguments of long-lasting stuff, etc. We might together conclude that we will deploy it, but not without questioning it because there's a difference now. People don't want it forever. IKEA, when you say the furniture doesn't last very long, guess what they say? Good. But that wouldn't be the argument. You don't, you it don't would be the same rent. stuff. But you would say, um, OK, here's an example. Um, you can go to auctions and get the brown, we'll call it the brown furniture. Right. But you know, um, when you go into a house with someone with all IKEA stuff, you have been in that house 18 times before in different places. So what's the next pendulum? No, I'm saying it's cheap. You can get a cheap thing. Yes, it won't be in his antique store, but it'll be in a place that people will be like, check out this table we got for $20, and it'll be a conversation starter. The point is, lots of people may have been brought up where that wasn't a cachet. I happen to have been. And I couldn't imagine being in a building where there wasn't something that was handed down or you found. And, and that's the thing. People want to be able to live as economically as possible because they don't have jobs. I wouldn't make that assumption that people want anything handed down. That was in the New York Not magazine. handed down. They precisely I, don't want, even want their parents dead. Not they want the puppy anything couch. <laughs> Not the puppy couch, but they might take something else. Straight to the dog. It's not puppy. Clever. But that doesn't mean it won't swing back. It will swing back. Okay, we just need to, as somebody said, you need to catch this lame bread. Did he now? That was his term. He preferred lame bread. I think there is a distinction between interior and exterior. I always sort of say that, you know, exterior the urbanism, everybody has to see it. The interior is more like art, you know, change it with fashion and times, and sure, you know, do what you want to do, style, things change. And so, some of that, I would say that I mean, almost the, the dwell crowd, if you had a, you know, good old building that has incredible bones, but it was all decked out and simplified, you know, modern kitchen, that's, that's to me, it's not, that's to me not in conflict with, you know, good, traditional class. To me, the, the bones are what are matters in the urbanism. And to me, to, I guess to some degree, <clears throat> what blends and, and attracts the, the culture at large is the fact that modern interiors can work with okay. good bones. Just one, one thing. Okay, so there was, there was a very important report done by Stanford Research Institute that it was actually reported as neo-traditionalism, and it's actually the, the basis of the book by um, called Bobo's in Paradise. And I was at that presentation, it was commissioned by Disney. And what they said, the woman, it was Stanford Research and Heinz and Kelovich both came up with the same conclusion. And uh, SRI had an 18th century, probably English interior with a beautiful mantelpiece and a little black German alarm clock on it. And the woman said, this is the way we think today. We select the room because it's beautiful and light and has beautiful trim, just, but we do not have an old clock that has to be wound and tick-tocks loud. He says, this is the future, whatever, you know. And then she showed a photograph of a bathtub, of a bathroom, and the bathroom had clawfoot tub. And they said, this is a traditionalist. They're willing to suffer 
for the and, and this is what she said. She said you slip in the bottom of the tub, and the little Our circular curtain, curtain sticks to you, and it's gross. Okay, but they're willing to serve. They're ideologues that are willing to to suffer for traditionalism. And then she showed a modernist thing, incredibly uncomfortable. That said they're willing to suffer with for modernism. And he says what we must be designing now is a traditional house with a modern Italian kitchen and a bathroom to kill for. Okay, and it was that that she presented. And this was, by the way, a very expensive report that was actually presented. She's looking for the pen. I think we all, we all recognize that actually we really don't want, you know, a, a, a bathroom that whatever, you know, that has somebody else's dentures on it. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. The, the luxury is taking a bath in the bathtub. That was what was missing. The, 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 images, right. the images have to be of spaces that people can imagine living the lives they live in, or the lives they want to live. And that's going to involve <coughs> jeans and bare feet and you know all the stuff that is kind of tough to picture in a lot of architectural digest interiors. But um, there, there needs to be you know, we, we need to get across that traditional and classical doesn't necessarily mean stuffy, hard to live in, formal, like you have to get dressed up to go into your dining room. Somebody um, earlier about the small house room. That exactly. That seems to be a piece of what you're talking about. It's kind right. of the average, everyday traditional. Mm -hmm. the and a lot of that is how things are staged for magazines. Mm -hmm. It's not even about what you built. It's not even about what you put in what you built. The people in what? Right. Right. Sure the people in right. It's the staging. Right. Can I contribute to that in the sense that I had the most dismal experience, I think probably a couple of weeks ago, the Architectural Digest Home Show in New York. Now, I went to that two years ago, and it was pretty dismal. But there were a few people that you know, looked as though they were interested in the idea of craftsmanship, like river moldings, nothing great, but the ideas that are ambushing the new kitchen, you know, they have the idea. Um, but I went a couple of weeks ago, and even they have gone. It's a different commodity now. It's a, essentially, it's the tyranny of decorators um, who are just trading stuff, and it's all, uh, very little was American. It was one very good chairmaker good luck to him, you know, from Vermont or somewhere. Everything else was mass-produced for quite rich people. You know, I'm not talking about IKEA, but the feel of IKEA, IKEA Plus, was there. And I just felt this is the end of, it was like the Court of Tiberius. It's the sort of decline of our civilization. If this is what wealthy people in New York want to live like, well, I think it's just, they're all living in Five star hotel. It was the and, people and who thing, could afford the entrance fee to be in that room. That's all that was. I was invited. Yeah. This is it. This <laughs> no, the, 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 to exhibit the exhibitors. Oh yes, sure. Yeah, yeah. Quite century. But it was really. I, I thought this is what I would have. They used to write good articles on 18th century French buildings and things. But if this is the direction they've moved, it's, that's just a folly. Well, one of the craziest things is how people view kitchens now. Yeah. That twice now I've been hired to redo a kitchen by someone who is selling the house, and then hired by the person who's bought the house to redo the kitchen that they want to live in. <laughs> you know, the, 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 there is a written, an unwritten assumption that if you buy a house, the first thing you're going to do is gut the kitchen. kitchen. Yes. And if you want to sell a house, the first thing you have to do is gut the kitchen. Um, <laughs> this came to us in the 80s and 90s through magazine, shelter magazines, right. who were telling us, oh, this is what you have to do. You have to update your kitchen. Well, why? We all remember the kitchen that was there, don't we? Yes, we do. We know that kitchen. It has to go. Um, and it's, it, these things perpetuate themselves. They stick to us, and now 30 years later, we're still replacing kitchens that don't need to be replaced. Exactly. Well, I'm, 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 I'm assuming that most of the people here have also worked with Property Brothers. HGTV. Oh, yeah. you have it? Uh, With who? Uh, Property Brothers. Um, we're doing a house right now in Dubs Ferry for HGTV. The Property Brothers, which are a twin guy, six foot five. One's a contractor and the other is a, a real estate agent. 
and they create the illusion that the perfect house is out there for everyone, but it's a fixer up. Mm -hmm. And it is amazing, and what I'll tell you is that my name will never be on it, not because of my choice, but because I've never even met the Property Brothers. We got all the approvals for everything, we did all the drawings, all that stuff, and then they show up and act like they've done the whole thing. And, 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 and this is all of the shows are fake. They're yeah. all fake. The, 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 and, and this is going out there to millions of people who are seeing this is what you do. Yeah. But the, but the media, the the media is the product. Because people are now looking at TV screens that are you know brightly lit. They're looking at bright interiors. That that's you know because like they used to look at magazines which was dull print you know and they they aspired to to those sort of dull and now they want a bright backlit um, you know they don't have paper. Uh, they will not. They will not do a project. And if, if the husband and wife don't fight, that isn't that's not projecting a bright. Exactly. Projecting a bright These, are These are old ideas. These are all old ideas. Old tired ideas. Plus, and get to know who it. has the pocketbook? Who wears the pants? Who makes the gifts? Age old. At, the, at this point, the bells of news have been rung. So, so um, we have some decisions oh, to make. I think oh, we've kind of discussed what framing oh, is. Yeah. and some framing options, yeah. and now it's starting to turn into what those fr specific frames might or could be, which might be an afternoon discussion. Do you all agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. All right, so we can pass on. Uh, we've got actually two topics going on concurrently now. Uh, what is uh, classicism? I think that was um, a slightly larger group. It's about 60-40, so maybe that'll stay in here. Or what is class classicism or classic? Yeah, classicism. What is yeah. classicism? classicism? And then the second group would be perhaps meeting back in the Nancy Hawk room, and that would be to discuss with Chris and Jenny the Charleston Charter and some of the subjects that surrounded that. Right. Okay? So if we could... Um, there were a couple people who were there to get their comments in. Yeah, I was going to say um, yeah. somewhat of a yeah. question, but for comment, I think to me the whole framing question, the idea of cultural relevance is just so important. That to me, the, you know, the, the, the interior versus exterior thing I talk about. There's one anecdote example. There's a, there's a firm I, I have a lot of respect for in, in based out of New York, Evroco, that does like restaurant design. You know. so I, I see that mostly as an academic that see this. I, mean, I don't yeah, see yeah. that amongst the common, common people. No, it's, 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 much. it's definitely academics, but it's also a lot of common people who are very sensitive to this idea of cultural relevance, who are very sensitive to the, to the idea that, you know, that they're curating their lives in such a way that their political, political progressiveness is emanated from their dress, emanated from the products they buy, from the food they eat. Real, real, but I'd like, to, I'd like to separate the idea of the interior and the exterior, though, because interior will come and go over time. The exterior, I think, is um, there's this reaction to globalism on many levels. And I think localism, all these other aspects are this reaction to the fact that we're all getting homogenized. There's so many more of us every year. And people just, you know, the, the idea of the, in music, for example, the sampling, want to be able to grab this and grab that and define yourself based on this constant uh, commercial world that constantly wants to consume and datify you into one type person. And I think so, I think traditionalism ought to frame itself somewhat based on, I mean, it, it is authenticity because what makes this place unique? What makes it special? I mean, people like in Logan Circle in D.C. where I used to live, and the developer I was talking to recently was saying, oh no, the kids all want the, you know, the concrete ceiling, and they want the this, and they want the that. And before the show, you know, before the talk, he showed me a picture of a house I did for him, which was a recreation of a, you know, the original log cabin, and then the federal edition, and then the this. And we have this beautiful shotgun recreation of a history. That's something authentic to that place in that time. So, and, and what I tried to tell them was, look, these kids might be buying those condos because they're available, but they're moving into a neighborhood that's 80%, 90% late Victorian. They're moving, to, they're moving away from the suburbs because they want something that speaks to something more transient, you know, less transient than the next flavor Madison's putting out. And people, no, no. people want things to endure. Well, want, because everything is so ephemeral, it, it just like keeps this, The around. more we're going to want that endure. Like we're coming to the making because, you know, I think you once said, people go to Starbucks because of Walmart. They got a little extra money, they now can go have their coffee. Well, it's the same thing. If you're going to have this world that's just moving and passing, go, 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 that desire to get your hands so dirty good. becomes yeah. more. And I think if you're looking for a pendulum enduring, the move to enduring, we were talking about, you know, what is classicism? To me, is the desire to endure past the latest trend in granite countertops. 
But it's not dirty. No, but, but there's, there's also one thing, by the way, yeah. this that we're describing now exists already. We don't have to, we don't have to spend, we can just go have a beer now and don't worry about it. Because right now old houses are being renovated with new interiors. And by the way, every McMansion has a, an inept but traditional exterior and a modernist interior. Okay? And they don't coincide, it's a disaster, it's a dog's breakfast. There is an architecture, there is a traditional architecture, an architecture that actually is essentially a free plan that actually coincides perfectly and with integrity with the interior. For example, your house in Charleston was essentially a wonderful house, it was a loft, it was a loft that had perfect deep structure with its, its exterior. Okay. The problem is that we're wielding a series of prototypes that in fact force the contradiction upon us. Instead of saying, well actually, our traditional architecture has evolved and developed a series of loft-like structures that have full integrity and that are actually able to deliver for today. I think we have a problem with the models that we have. And that's where I say the orthodoxy is continually bringing up Palladio and then Palladio fights you. Instead of saying, you know, your Charleston single house in its original floor plan was perfectly modern. And that's not wielded properly. Maybe it is here, but it's not wielded. And I think we need to have a new canon, a new canon of floor plans, a new canon of <coughs> materials, and so forth, so that we don't have to live with these contradictions any longer. So it has that integrity and authenticity. And it doesn't have to be torn up all the time. Perhaps. So like, for example, a federal period New York triple um, parlor, double door, uh, two double door townhouse. It's basically an open plan with a dining room and everything, since the kitchen is downstairs. Um, the sort of colonial house where everything, it's, there's the so-called living room has the cooking, has the table, has everybody sitting around the fireplace. Right. There's one room yep. that everybody uses that's basically an, an open plan interior. We're actually, we have this heritage, have maybe this is a good thing to segue because when I, somebody says, what is classicism, I, I kind of balk at that a little bit because I want to know what, we're, what we can like, hold claim to. I want to be able to hold claim to the, uh, well, not maybe income, but yeah, I mean, at least the architecture of, you know, Inca and, and, and Mayan and that sort of thing, maybe not the human sacrifice. <laughs> and uh, the, you know, Nineveh, you know, Nineveh may, pisses me off. I want to lay claim to that because somebody else destroyed it. Okay? I mean, I feel really strong about that. Okay. I, I, but, I, but I want to say, you know, there's Mali, you know, there's stuff in Mali. You know, we can say, yes, we want to be, in a sense, we want to be multicultural. There is this world that is being bulldozed by crap. Absolutely. And it's being bulldozed in, in the name of um, corporate people. And this, you know, this caliphate idea, yeah. it's being bulldozed by both ends, and we can lay claim to the stuff that's being bulldozed. Okay, one thing. Okay, the fact that schools, that schools send their kids to Rome, okay, where the floor plans are completely impossible, and the bathrooms are, and every apartment is too dark, and they don't know anything about Charleston, and they don't know anything about New Orleans, and I see these kids all the time that have Palladio crossed all over their neural network. You know, and everything has to be symmetrical and it doesn't work out inside, as opposed to saying we have by right now our own right? tradition. Who are these people then? Oh, 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 come on. Come on, who are these people? Don't that is a threat. The fact is, say that. no, of course you're not going to say that. But I can look at the work right here, okay, from here. Just look at the books that are published by the ICA and Notre Dame and everybody else. The and the whole that, exactly. The class. How dare they? How dare they? Read the the exactly. Okay, but what the, what bugs me is how they don't know her house in, in Charleston, which is now 300 years old. They don't know that. They're, in other words, the models that we have are archaic, and we, the, this classicism that we're talking about can have a much better fit to the modern world and still be traditional if we don't go to goddamn Rome every time. Okay. That's what I'm the classicism the is much wider than Rome. It's much wider than Rome. Let me it's, get back to what Bernie in fact, said Rome, because this is, this is the main uh, impetus for Inbound as a global network as, as such as it is. 
is this perception that it's in, in your own backyard, maybe you say, oh yeah, let's get rid of that stuff, it's old hat, we want to move into the future and be exciting and trendy. Uh, but in the, the places where you visit, you see the destruction of the traditional fabric and people are horrified. We have many modernists who are very sympathetic to Inbau who want to uh, get involved in order to uh, preserve or, or, or sustain the quality of these environments. So people can see this destruction going on around the world and, they, and that's a very galvanizing, very powerful force. Are we getting into classicism now? I, I think we are. Yeah, I think we are. And um, we're also about an hour and a quarter which, I mean, it's fine. We're an hour and a quarter beyond schedule. Uh, we can extend things later this afternoon, but I would think that at this time, we do have lunch here. So rather than go into our second session as we had planned before lunch, how about we all break for lunch? Thank you. Can I just say, I think that this conversation totally focused too much on residential architecture, and that this is a big problem. This, Gary Brewer suggested on TradArc that one of the sessions be moving beyond residential architecture, because historically, architecture is not about houses. It's about institutional buildings. Yeah. Those are the important buildings in the society. It's about cities. And, 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 and the question is, how do you change those? It's very different than Wall Magazine. And there's a big problem that our elites are just simply not educated anymore. So we talk about the classical tradition. Classical is not a good term anymore. Who listens to classical music except they have crap on, you know, it's all dumbed down on the radio station. People have not read Plato and Aristotle, right? To the extent that they've read any philosophy, it's Foucault and all this other bullshit. That is a whole other problem. That's why the, our elites don't have any cultural backbone. Even if they have intuitions about what's good or bad, they'll ultimately say, well, it's just a matter of taste, even though, of course, they have really strong taste. And I don't know how to deal with that problem, but that's a civilizational one. I think there's one way to, I don't know that it's a solution. I'm not saying this is a solution, but one way to get more um, of a public awareness that there is an alternative is and something that perhaps, this is something I think we could fight for, is the idea of the counter-proposal, the value of counter-proposal to architecture, and having the civic, um, you know, the civic uh, municipal governments, whoever they are, invested in that, in that process, where there's the idea of, or, you know, just we have, like we have the, what's it, the Beautiful America Movement? What was that? City Beautiful. City Beautiful City Movement. Beautiful. Um, you know, a movement that not, not tackling it dead, you know, dead on that. Oh, we need to push traditional architecture, but simply pr push the, for the idea if it's a if it's a monumental project, uh, be it directly civic or of the scale of civic architecture, that there need to be counter proposals. Because if there's going to be a counter proposal, it's not going to be one modernist counter proposal versus another modernist proposal that's already being pushed by the developer. To be counter, it actually has to be different. I mean, I think we benefit from that process. And on, and on top of that, once these things are done, how do we get them out into the public? I mean, we have a lot of you know, brilliant ideas. We're talking about framing. This is all really good. We talked about having a session on new media, but what about just regular media? I like the idea of talking about the HGTV and the things that, that that's the that's the consumer target, right? And that's trying to get We'll see. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. But also, we've got a, you know, a number of writers in the room that are doing a really great job at bringing these ideas out into the public. How do we get more of that happening so that when these counter proposals do come up, they become conversation rather than you know, back page. Exactly. You know, or no page at all. Exactly. Right. Yeah. I think at this point, we need to have somebody working on the problem of what kind of food can we have delivered at 8 o'clock at night in this neighborhood. <laughs> Robert, catch Robert. Um, I just want to say, I, I don't have a dog in this fight. Um, for one, I take a shower in a claw foot tub uh, with a gray shower curtain, and I have to get the hair out of the drain, and I don't mind it. Um, but I feel like I'm at a retreat, uh, that, that we're here with Squibb, and, and we're talking about how do we beat Bristol Myers. And I don't see that in what I do. I, I uh, work with clients that don't really care about that kind of stuff. Um, it's really looking at the timeless, the what, what, what makes me feel better when I come into a room? Uh, what makes me feel better when I walk down the street? What makes me feel better, that, that, that awe? What, is, what creates awe? 
And uh, I guess I was kind of hoping that that would be more the subject of what we were really talking about. You know what's awesome? Uh, also we, I, 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 would, I would say that, that we do things which are pendulum optional. You, you can rip it all out if you want, but you don't have to. And, uh, and, and, and we're doing a kitchen now where they're ripping out a fancy high-end kitchen, uh, but it's the face doors and you know the marble countertop and all the rest of it, uh, fancy stove, and we're putting in the exact same kitchen, uh, probably going to cost close to $200,000, uh, but, but the doors are all in line with the carcass. Yeah. Quality. It's, it's Quality. got buck hinges, it's uh, uh, all this kind of stuff. And real, real wood, real wood. And, uh, um, so the next owner may come and rip it all out. But they'll be, and we're putting in moldings in all the rooms, and the owner is just thrilled. He, just, I, he loves putting, wearing his moldings. <laughs> I'd like to follow up on um, what Justin's comment about uh, commercial architecture. Um, being from New Orleans, they've just recently um, the, they have the, the new gigantic hospital complex that's being built, and um, it, it was you know the after Katrina thing where Charity Hospital was um, somehow deemed unsuitable, um, and so they had to build this new complex. And, and I think the problem is is that um, people are just accepting you know that they they take the Merits of the project, and and they and that's all. And as long as they've got that, that's acceptable. It's like you know, we need a certain number of beds, we need a hospital, we need a trauma, a level one trauma emergency room, and we need certain operating rooms and stuff like that. And and we need this, and and as long as you have all of that, the rest of it doesn't seem to matter. And this is such a big project; it's so visible, you can see it everywhere. And the bigger the project is, the more the architecture seems to less matter, and and it should be the reverse because the bigger the project is, the more visible it is, the more you see it, and something is just not right. I mean, people just seem to accept whatever is presented to them because they need the project, they need the hospital, or they need you know this, or you know the hotel needs a certain number of rooms, or, or a parking garage needs a certain number of, of spaces, and and as long as you as long as you've accommodated that, that's all you basically you, you've done your task, and, and and nobody goes any further to try to make the make that building beautiful. And I think um, that's the value of the council. Yeah. Also, yeah, if we can get that. And, and if and if you're opposed to if you're opposed to the way the, the hospital looks, you're opposed to the hospital. Right. Well, you yeah. know, and, and, and then that becomes an, an argument. You know, but when you if get you're into opposed to the VA hospital, you're, you're against the veterans. <laughs> but when you get into certain things, like hospitals that have all sorts of requirements and all sorts of codes you need to pass, it's more about the specialty architect that knows how to do all of that. But they Michael's right. There may be a day when it's not a hospital anymore, and yeah. we are stuck with the shell and the exterior and the, all the non-innered aspects of that building and whether we can even afford to keep it. It won't make it that long, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> those hospital specialists often partner with right. and a general right. architect. Well, this, 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 this is already anecdotal, but I, I was in David Schwartz's office two days ago, and I saw on the wall a big, beautiful hospice that he's designing. And the way he pulled it off was by understanding the limits of his language. He worked with a hospital architect who doesn't care about aesthetics, who knows how to house all the equipment, and he, he said they divided their tasks. And they had a client who understood that we have to give our patients an experience in this way, but we also have to solve the cancer problem. And when, by working together and understanding the limits of their own discipline, that. they produced a beautiful hospital. A beautiful hospital that is capable of expanding. That, but that's what a resilient type is, and that's what Lo and behold, traditional forms are very good at the doing traditional form because had to they've evolved to do precisely. Exactly, but it had to, they had to compromise. Well, that's they, part of the process. Part, yeah. that's yeah. part, it's part of a process that we are not very good at either doing or conveying to the public we're capable of. Yeah, but, but evolution is fundamental to everything. Yeah. We're I think we're about. really, really getting into the class yeah. of yeah. what is classicism yeah. conversation. Yeah. So.